All right. So this is one of my favorite topics. Why is it one of my favorite topics? Because I kind of love it when stuff blows your mind. You guys know that from like lots of other chapters we've talked where I've tried to say, hey, this should blow your mind. Sometimes it did, sometimes you're like, whatever. But this stuff blows my mind. Every time, I, every time I think about it, every time I talk about it, every time I like put any effort into like dealing with this, it blows my mind. We're going to talk about this thing called special relativity. Now, you guys know who came up with special relativity? Special relativity. And there's also general relativity, which we'll get to after we do this. But yes, what did you say? Einstein. Albert Einstein. OK, one of the most famous scientists ever. E equals mc squared, exactly. Well, that all comes from this topic of special relativity. Now, a little bit on Albert Einstein. He was uh, a scientist who went to, got his uh, like PhD in, in like the 1800s, didn't get a job teaching, went off and became a patent clerk in Switzerland. Okay, and he became this patent clerk whereby he sat around all day like looking at other people's patents. But he had a lot of time to think. During the year, let's see, 1903 to maybe 1905, I don't know the exact dates, he came up with like three or four papers, it might have been five even, that blew away other scientists. It was completely new stuff. Nobody had ever thought of like this before. One of the things he came up with, special relativity. And it blew people's minds away because it's so bizarre. And when you think about it the first time, like we'll think about it today, you'll go, I, I don't know if I understand if that makes sense. But let's see how we go. OK? You ready for this? All right. Nothing there. OK. What's that? Oh, it's a tin apple, a snapple. There you go. That was a joke. Uh, I think the XKCD comic came up with that joke. I do not take credit for that. OK. Let's talk about time. The, for, the, for the camera, Louis said, are we going to learn about time travel? We are going to learn about time travel. Nice. OK. But let's talk about time for a minute. OK. Sitting here on Earth, time travels, if you want to call it that. Time doesn't really travel, but let's think about it this way. Time travels 24 hours per day, 60 minutes per hour, 60 seconds per minute. That makes sense, right? Every minute that goes by, 60 seconds. Tick, 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 right? Now, it turns out that if you're moving through space, that actually affects how fast you move through time. It's related, as it turns out. You wouldn't necessarily think that. If I'm going this way, my watch seems to tick at the same amount of ticks per second, which seems kind of crazy to say it any other way. If I'm going one way or the other, or speeding up or slowing down, right? It just seems that way. Okay. Well, Albert Einstein came around and he said, hey, hold on a sec. There is this relationship between space and time. Okay? He said, and this is in 1905, I guess this font's a little weird, sorry about that. It's kind of supposed to be like all futuristic. 1905, he said, when we go through space, and space being any, the universe where we live, right? When we go through space, we also change our rate of proceeding into the future. In other words, the faster we move through space, the slower we move in the future. Like literally, the slower we move into the future. Okay? He said that time itself is actually altered. Okay? This is weird. Think about that for a minute. Time, in other words, your clock, your watch, ticks differently as you move faster or slower. Okay? He called this special relativity. He called the special theory of relativity. Okay? All right. Now, special relativity, this special theory describes how this happens, how time is affected as we move through space at a constant velocity. Remember constant velocity versus acceleration? Constant velocity is when you're not accelerating. 
Okay, so keep that in mind. We'll get to that in a little bit. And he also described how mass and energy are related, which you guys already told me. What's that formula? E equals m c squared. Exactly. Okay. Now, Isaac Newton, our favorite scientist who first came up with physics, yeah. right? Newton and other scientists, they thought of space, right? as being this infinite place where everything exists. So everything exists in space. Right? We kind of get that. Everything exists to a point. All right, if you want to, there's other ideas. But in terms of like physical stuff, it exists in space. So far, so good? Turns out it wasn't quite clear if the universe exists in space or if space exists in the universe. In other words, is the universe like this and space is inside of it? And there's nothing outside the universe, not even space. Like you've got the universe, and then outside you've got the, the universe, right? Or, or maybe not. You can actually ask the same question about time. Bear with me on this. Okay? Does the universe exist in time? Or does time, your watch, tick, 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 exist within the universe? In other words, okay, is time part of the universe or is it external to the universe? Like here's the universe, outside the universe time is still ticking along. Nobody ever really thought of this. Why would you? It doesn't seem like you need to think about it, right? Craziness. Sounds like craziness. Okay, well then Einstein came along. Einstein said let's think about that. Aha. Okay. Einstein answered these questions and he said, here's the deal guys, space and time only exist in the universe. Okay? Outside the universe, you can't even talk about space or time, which is weird because we don't think like that normally. We don't think if you go to the edge of the universe and you step out of the universe, time is going to be just gone. There is, because there, time goes, goes on, right? Well, you got to think that way. Okay. He said, I've got this idea that space and time are actually the same idea. He made it easy. He called it space-time. Okay. All right. Now, here's how we have to think about this. Okay. We need to stop thinking about moving through time itself to moving through space-time. Okay. And this is where I talked about that idea of going going through space affecting the time itself. Okay? Everyone in the universe travels through a combination of this space and time. Okay? You ready for this? All right. When you stand still, pretend we're standing still, pretend the earth is not moving through space, pretend the sun is not moving through space, we're just standing still. You're only moving through what? Time. You're just standing there. Time is going by, you're watching your watch, tick, 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 tick. You're not moving through space at all. And that makes sense. When you move a bit, you start moving. Now you're moving through space and time. Right? So far so good? Because you are. I am moving through space. My watch is still ticking away. Okay. Well, if you could go the speed of light. Remember how we said the speed of light was the fastest thing in the universe? Nothing could actually go faster than the speed of light. Okay, it's impossible. Okay? If you could go the speed of light, it turns out you would only be traveling through space and not time. Here's what this means, actually. So remember how we said uh, the sun takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. If you could hitch yourself to that little beam of light, you would look at your watch, and it would say 650. And then you'd go all the way to Earth, and you'd look at your watch, and it would say 650, not 658. Because light only travels through space. Light does not travel through time. Now, you and I are watching the sunlight come to us, and we know that if the light starts the sun, and it takes eight minutes to get here. So on our watch, it says 658. 
But the light, its watch only says 650 because it only goes through space, not time. And there's a range of values here. If I'm standing here, I'm only going through time. As I go a little faster, I'm going through space and time. As I go a little faster, I'm going through space and time, but a different ratio. And it's a ratio, one to the other. And we'll look at what that ratio is eventually. But as you go faster and faster and faster, time actually slows down. The difference in running and walking is so small we can't measure it. But it is there. They have measured it on Earth. Well, they've measured it in like the space shuttle going around. Astronauts who are in space going really, really fast, they actually age at a different rate than you. But we'll get to that. Tom? How about if you're on a treadmill? Uh, if you're on a treadmill, your legs are moving. But the rest of you, maybe not. So OK. OK, so now. As far as the light cares, there is no time. Light, light does not experience time. It only experiences space. So as far as light's concerned, the instant it's created is the instant it arrives at its next location. It's just the way it is. OK? All right. Whew. We're getting there. OK. So motion through space actually affects your motion in time, is what we talked about. Every time we move through space, we do affect our movement through time. Because the effects involve things as fast as like the speed of light, you don't actually notice it very often. In fact, humans never noticed it until Einstein came along and thought about it. In fact, he hadn't quite noticed it yet. But there were, there were some people who did notice it. And we'll we'll get, to, get to that in a little bit. But this idea that time slows down as you go through space is called time dilation. Okay? What that means is time is actually dilated, in other words, slowed down as you go through space. Okay? Some of you guys are like, I don't think so. This doesn't make any sense. But bear with me on this. Okay? Doesn't even make sense in everyday speeds. Okay. Now, whenever we talk about motion, we have to think about where we're actually looking at it from. Okay? Keep in mind, we have, to, we have to put ourselves like somewhere where we're thinking about where that motion going through space is, is there. So here's an example. Okay, everybody put themselves in this example. You are in a train, train car, right? And it's moving at 180 kilometers per hour. The amount doesn't really matter. You walk down the aisle of the train at 5 kilometers per hour in the same direction. How fast are you moving? 185 kilometers per hour or 5 kilometers per hour? Depends where you are watching from, really. If I'm in the train and I'm walking at 5 kilometers per hour, can't I, relative to the train, say I'm walking at 5 kilometers per hour? Yep. Right? Because I am. And, right, and, and if I go and like, I go, you know, slap somebody's hand as I go by, we're each going to slap a hand very slow speed. If I'm standing out, if someone's standing outside the train watching me go by, how fast do they think I'm going? 185. 185. And if I slap their hand, it would hurt. Right? Okay? So relative to the train, you're moving 5 kilometers per hour. Relative to the ground, you're moving 185 kilometers per hour. We get that. Speed is a relative quantity. Depends on where it's observed and measured. This is very important. OK. Now, you're standing on a train caboose. Everybody knows what a caboose is, the end of the train, right? Standing on the end of a train. And you shoot an arrow out the back of the train. And it goes 50 kilometers per hour. OK? The target gets hit how fast? 50 kilometers per hour. And let's say you have a little detector on the target that says, how fast was the arrow when it hit? Maybe we can create that. Sure, 50 kilometers per hour. So the train's at rest. Okay, The arrow is going 50 kilometers per hour relative to the train. And it hits the target at 50 kilometers per hour. So far, so good? All right. I'm sorry, you said the train is at rest? Train's not. It's just sitting there. Train's not moving now. Train, caboose of a train that is not moving. All right. Now, let's say the train was going towards the target 
at 20 kilometers per hour. Okay? If it's, the arrow's going 50 when it comes off the bow, and you're going 20 towards the arrow, how fast does the target get hit? 70 kilometers, 70 kilometers per hour. Everybody gets that so far? Add the speeds. Okay. All right, just add the speeds. 20 relative to the train, uh, 20 kilometers per hour relative, sorry, the train is going 20 kilometers per hour. The arrow relative to the train is 50. The arrow relative to the target, 70. Hits the target, 70. What if it's going the other way? The train's going away from the target at 30 kilometers per hour. And the arrow's going 50. How fast does it hit the target at? 20 kilometers. Now it's 20 kilometers per hour because you subtract them. This one's going this way. I shoot the arrow out, right? By the way, let's say the train was going uh, 50 kilometers per hour. What would happen to the arrow? It would drop straight down. It would drop straight down. It would go boop and drop down. That didn't really happen, right? You could do that. I mean, you know, it would be a little weird, but you could do that. Okay. Anyway, the arrow hits the target now 20 kilometers. So we're all on the same page here. So far, so good? All on the same page. Okay. I'm getting there. How did that happen? How did what happen? <laughs> How did which happen? I mean, when we went on patrol in Iraq, we were shot at while the vehicle was moving. And we had to well, 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 let's say that, well, OK. So let's, what's the speed of your rifle? Yeah. How fast does the bullet go out of the rifle? 1,000 miles an hour? Yeah, 850. I mean, 850, 850, 850 miles an hour? 850. Miles per hour or meters per second? It's, it's usually a matter of feet per second. Feet per second? Yeah. OK, 850 feet per second. Your train would have to be going 850 feet per second. But if your train was going 850 feet per second, that's moving. And you shot the gun out the back, the bullet would go boop. Right? Because it's going 850 that way, you're going this way 850. Relative to the ground, it's going zero. It's done. It would go just hit the ground. It's generally in the thousands. Right. Gravity wins. What's that? It's generally in the thousands. Thousands, all right, all right. But that, but that makes sense to everybody in terms of the, like, what's really going on, right? OK. All right. Now, here's the wrench. What if, what if something weird started happening where your arrow speed detector started measuring the arrow's speed at the same speed no matter if you were going towards the target, away from the target, or standing still. What would you say? What would you say? The, the, the detector's messed up, right? Uh -huh. Something's messed up. The detector's broken, right? That's what you'd say, OK? I'd say the same thing. Of course you would, right? Well, turns out. This guy named A. A. Mickelson. And he actually had a speed of light experiment, much different than Ole Romer's that we did last night. He actually had a uh, rotating set of mirrors, and he would bounce light off it, and he'd measure the, how long it took to, or he'd measure the, uh, the distance between the mirror and some other place where he'd measure the light. And he ended up figuring out the speed of light. So this guy was a really good scientist. Okay? And this other guy called Morley, Mickelson and Morley, two really good scientists. In fact, the best scientists in the world, late 1800s, some of the best scientists in the world, they knew how to measure the speed of light. Okay? Okay. So what they said was, let's check the speed of light as the Earth is going around its, on its axis. Let's shoot light west and measure how fast it is. And then let's shoot light east and measure how fast it is. Okay? Relative to the Earth, right? Or I guess relative to uh, the Earth's motion. So from outer space, let's say you're standing outside Earth, and you measure how fast light's going in one way when the Earth is going the opposite way, right? And then they did the other way. They measured the opposite direction when the Earth was going in the same direction. Just like the arrow example on the train. Okay, the Earth's going one way, the Earth's going the other way. Turns out they measured that the speed of light was exactly the same going one way or when the Earth is when you when you turn around and point it the other way and the Earth is going in the opposite direction. This is exactly like your arrow speed detector being messed up. What do you think they said? They said it can't be right. What, what's that, Lou? Uh, 
was going to say that the thing that women at the speed of space, not, or space, not the speed of uh, uh, time. Ah, they didn't know anything about this yet. Oh. This is before they knew anything about all this relativity business. What they said was, oh, guess we did the experiment wrong. Right? Because they couldn't, that couldn't be the case. If you measure light going one way and, it's, and the Earth is going that way, it should be faster than if you measure it the other way when the Earth's coming the other direction, just like our train example. So they did the experiment again. Guess what they found out? Same speed of light. And they went, ah, oh, we, we did it wrong again, right? And they did this a number of times, right? And they said, they did this a number of times and they said, uh, to all the scientists in the world, basically, they said, hey guys, um, so it turns out that uh, light goes 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, um, regardless of which way, if, it's, if the source is moving one way or the other or the other. Right? Well, if you said that about your aero detector, everybody would say, well, you broke it. But everybody knew that the Nicholson and Morley dudes were pretty good scientists. Okay? They're pretty darn good scientists. So they said, well, if Mickelson and Morley tell us this is true, this might be true. And in that case, things are weird. Okay, things are weird. They did it lots of times, lots of results. Nothing could vary the speed of light. They kept measuring, kept measuring. Nothing changed it. Turns out, physics, the physicists back then were like, whoa, this is not a good thing. <laughs> physics, as they knew it, was about to change in a big, big way. Okay? Now. Along comes our friend Al Einstein. Okay? Good old Albert. Comes along and he says, fine. He said, look, if speed is distance divided by time, which we all know, okay? and speed is just the amount of space travel compared to the amount of time traveled, he said, well, what if we rethink this a little bit? If we know that we've got this space time, which we already talked about, okay? And if light travels at a constant speed, in other words, this is fixed. That's how fast light goes, no matter what this and this are. Okay, you're going to get the same value. Okay, I mean, not no matter what this is, but if you have a distance and blah, 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 blah to the time, you know the speed is going to be the fixed part. Well, turns out that he said, all right, we can now look at this as the idea that, we, well, he, sorry, he said, I have to come up with these ideas to figure out why this is the case. Here's what he came up with. Okay? Call these Einstein's postulates, meaning his like, statements about this. He said, number one, all the laws of nature are the same in uniformly moving frames of reference. Uniformly moving is another fun way of saying constant. If things are moving at a constant speed, the laws of nature are the same. Why did he say that? Well, it makes everything come out. It makes it so you can't cheat when you're trying to figure out the answer. He says, look, the laws of physics are the same no matter what. That was his first thing. Okay? Basically, he said, nothing is actually stationary that we can measure against. That's what this really boils down to. It says, I can't say the sun is stationary. Why? Because the sun could say, hey, no, no, you're stationary, and I'm the one going around you. Okay? Although it doesn't really work out because when you're going in a circle, you are accelerating. But let's say two spaceships are passing each other at the constant speed. Who's the one moving and who's not? Okay, let's say, one's, let's say, let's say uh, if they're at constant speed, if you're moving and you don't know your speed, let's say you don't know your speed relative to anything else, well, it looks just like you go past, and there's nothing else to look behind to see. You go past something, well, you don't know if it's moving. You think it's the one that's stationary. Well, if they're the ones moving, maybe, they will go look at you and think you're stationary. The, Einstein's point was you can't tell. His point was you can't tell, and there's no experiment you can do to figure out which one's actually moving, so don't worry about it. Okay, that was his point. So it's like when you park huh? your car and the guy next to you is pulling out, you freak out because you think your brakes are That's Yeah, you, that, that's actually a good way of thinking about it. When you park your car and, you, and your brakes are on and the guy next to you moves and you think you're moving because it freaks out, it's a little bit like that. A spaceship can only measure its speed relative to something else. It can't measure it relative to empty space. There's no way to do it. That's what he said. Okay. Now, all right. Here's how it works. If two objects drift past each other at constant speed, neither spaceship 
will be able to tell which is one it's rest if one happens to be at rest. They won't be able to tell. If one's accelerating, yes, you can tell. How do you tell? Because your coffee spills. All right? If you're accelerating, what did we say accelerations come from? Speed. Accelerations equals something divided by mass. What was it? There we go. Force divided by mass. Forces cause accelerations. If something forces you in a direction and you accelerate, your coffee sloshes a little bit. Think of it that way. Okay. We'll get into that more in a little bit of detail. Okay. Now, neither spaceship can tell which one's at rest. Okay, here's an example. If you're on a train at the stop and you look out the window, sometimes it looks like the train next to you is moving backwards, exactly what Tom just said. Sometimes you're at, but you're actually moving forward. You can't really tell. Sometimes. Is that optical illusion? Well, that's kind of an optical illusion. But if, if you are on a perfectly smooth tracks, like in like Japan where they have magnetic tracks that are perfectly smooth, right? And you were going this way and another train came back this way, you wouldn't be able to tell who was actually moving by doing any experiment unless you were able to see outside both trains. Like if you see the ground outside, then you'd be able to tell. But otherwise, you can't tell. Okay? All right? If you can't look out the windows of your car, and you're going at constant speed on a perfectly smooth road, you can't tell you're moving. Believe it. You can't. No way to do it. What, what would tell you that you're moving? Nothing. No forces acting on you. You can't look out the window, so you just don't know. Okay? Remember, right now, we're moving 1,000 miles an hour. Actually, we're moving like 30,000 miles an hour through space. Can you feel it? No, you can't feel it. Right? It's, it's not constant speed. We're actually accelerating. But if it was constant, it's close to constant speed. But you can't tell. You're right. It's close to 30,000 miles per hour. You have no idea. The acceleration probably is minimal. So right. The acceleration is minimal, so you don't feel it. Yeah, exactly. And, and the point is you can't tell. OK. All right. Here's another quick example. Flip a coin in your car, moving at constant speed. Where's the, where's the coin land? On your hand. Did it know that you were moving 50 miles down the road per hour down the road? When the flight attendant pours your Coca-Cola on the plane, it doesn't go flying past you. It goes into your cup. Because you're all moving all relative to each other, you can't tell. Or Jack Daniels, if you really you know. OK. Basically, no way to detect. OK. No way to detect it. All right, we're getting there. He also said, this is postulate number two. The speed of light will always have the same value regardless of who's moving or whether they're moving. This is odd, too. This is, that goes back to the Michelson-Morley experiment where he says, hey, looks like the speed of light's fine. Einstein said, fine, I'll believe it. He said, speed of light's fine. It's going to get somewhere. Trust me. If you go back to the train arrow example, if you flew along beside the arrow, what would it look like? Stand still. In fact, you could take the arrow, look at it, go, wow, this is a pretty cool looking arrow, and then put it back out and let it and it would hit the target. If you were moving at 50 miles an hour. Right? Can we can we try it? Yeah, good question. I've seen I've seen like the videos on YouTube where they do similar things like that, but it's not with an arrow. But yeah, you could do that. I mean, you know, that's the way it is. It's yeah, can it's really synchronize the speed. Well Okay, here here's an example. Here's an example. So Let's, let's, uh, let's say you hold an apple outside your window in the car, right? And you let it go. Where does it land? Right. Not if you're, if you're moving down the road at 50 miles an hour, where does it land? It feels like it's going down. I dropped it. Well, right, it lands, but let's say outside the car, it like moves 50, 50 yeah, it feels feet. Like it's going past it feels like it's going past, yeah. There you go. Yeah, you could, you could kill somebody by like driving down the road, holding an apple out, if they're like walking down the side of the road, holding an apple out and letting the apple go, it's going to go whack and hit right into him, just like if you were you know, in your car. Because it's moving 60 miles an hour, at least when it starts. right? OK. So the arrow would look like it starts. Einstein said the same question about light. If you could travel beside it, okay, if you could travel beside it, close to the speed of light, you would measure the speed of light moving away from you at 300 million meters per second. He said, doesn't work the same way as the arrow. okay? If you were able to go the speed of light and you, and you were next to light, it would look like it was going the speed of light. No change. That's a little weird. Okay? That's definitely weird. He did not. He did not because the speed of light is the same. Always. Where whoever's doing the measuring. 
So this is where it starts getting a little weird. But yeah, go ahead. If there's any way you can slow down the light speed? Well, in a vacuum, we're saying. If you, if you put light through water, remember, it will slow down. But in that material, nothing can go faster than that speed. Okay. Whatever the speed of light in that material is, nothing goes faster than that in that material. Yeah. OK. All right, so you ready? In other words, the speed of light in all reference frames is the same. And this is where Einstein made this big leap. He said, all right, Nicholson and Morley tell me that's true. I'd better believe it. This idea led to a lot of paradoxes. What's a paradox? Arguments. What is it? Arguments. Arguments, not quite. Sorry? It's, yeah, paradox is an argument without an answer. This can be right and this can be right, but they contradict each other. Right? Well, it's more than a hypothesis. It's, it's, here, I'll say it again. If this is right and this is right, but they contradict each other, that's a paradox. Because they both can't be right and contradict each other. Which is science, actually. Well, it's kind of like science, yeah. But this, act, this idea actually led to lots of paradoxes. Okay. Turns out it was, measured for, it was measured to be true. So Einstein said, fine, fine, fine. I'll figure it out. OK. So what did he do? Let's, let's figure it out. How about this? Do you want to take another break? Or do you want to do it in like 10 minutes? This is kind of interesting stuff. We'll just keep going. OK. All right. So here's your example. You've got a mothership and a baby ship. OK? And the mothership's trying to communicate with the baby ship by shooting a beam of light at the baby ship. Okay, flashing a light, just like we do on ships or in planes or whatever. Well, we use radios now, but radio is basically light. So that's it. The baby ship, no matter what speed it's going, sees the light at going 300,000 kilometers per second. That's how fast it measures it. Whether the, whether the space, baby's going this way or this way or this way or whatever, it's always going to look out and go, that light is coming at me at 300,000 kilometers per second. There is no change. Okay, No difference. Questions. Yeah, question. On the previous slide, you said 300 million? Ah, 300 million, where did I, there's 300 million meters per second, which is equal to 300,000 kilometers per second. Yeah, I changed units on you. Sorry about that. Good observation. Very good observation, though. OK, 300,000 kilometers per second. OK. Whew. Now, in order to understand this idea of time dilation, where time actually changes, we have to construct a little thought experiment. Okay, Einstein was really good at these. It's where you think about something and go, what if, what if, what if, and you, you work out the logic of it all, and you figure out what happens. Okay? So Einstein said, pretend you're in, this, in a spaceship sitting outside our classroom. The class. OK, you're sitting outside a class here. And there's a clock. Let's say I took that clock outside, OK? And we looked at it, OK? And it happened to read 12 noon exactly, OK? All right? How does, what does that mean when we say the clock says 12 noon? Well, doesn't it mean that light hits the clock and then comes back to you and goes into your eyeball and your eyeball says, and your brain says, that says 12 noon. That makes sense? OK. If you were to look at that and then all of a sudden move your head, the beam of light that was going to hit you goes right past. So far, so good? OK. If I was to look, let's say I was to look from outer space at this clock. The person who hit that beam of light, instead of hitting my eye and saying it was noon, went out to that person out in outer space. And he's looking at the clock. And he sees the clock that's, and, and sees that it says 12 noon. But didn't you see the time at different times? In other words, if I'm 10 feet from the clock, it takes a bit of time for the light to get to me. If I had moved my head and that light hadn't hit me, the light takes some time to get back to the wall back there. And so if I was to look at that and when it's right at noon, it would be a different, it would look at, be at a different time than if the person standing back there looked at the clock and said noon. Doesn't that make sense? It's getting a little odd, but it makes sense though, right? The difference would be really, 
because it would be negligible certainly but let's let's make it let's make it not negligible let's say that somebody's way out in space one light year away okay and he looks at the clock when you look at the clock and see that it's noon and then if you move your head and the light goes flying past you and some guy's a light year away looking through a telescope he sees that how long from now exactly one year a year later he says it's noon back there and you've already gone through a year more of your life right again it, I mentioned this the other day if somebody on a planet 65 million years or 65 million light years away was looking through their telescope at Earth right now, what would they see? They'd see dinosaurs. Right? Right now, if they're looking at the Earth, they go, hey, look, dinosaurs. They have dinosaurs down there. They're looking at our dinosaurs because the light from the dinosaurs is just reaching them now. Make sense? So there's a, there's a difference in when you observe something, whether you're there next to it or whether you're far, far away. So far, so good? All right. Now, Pretend you are in the spaceship moving away from the classroom at the speed of light. Haha, <laughs> now you're moving at the speed of light. What time is it if the light is going next to you and you're going at the speed of light away? What time does the clock say? It says noon. And you keep going farther away, and what time does it say? Noon. noon. And you keep going far it never changes. So as far as you're concerned, time on Earth has stopped. Okay? Now, time is frozen. Okay. So so oops. So those are actually the extremes. If you're standing right next to something and you read it, time is going one second per second. Click, click, click. If you're going along with a beam of light looking back at some clock on Earth, time is stopped. There's a middle ground here too, right? You could be going half the speed of light, right? And then the time on Earth would seem like it's half as fast. Okay? Although, although the math might not work out that way, we'll find out about that. Okay? So if you are traveling slower than the speed of light, the clock would run somewhat slow, wouldn't it? Isn't this a little weird? If you're going half the speed of light, let's say you're going half the speed of light, right? And you're going away from the clock. Wouldn't it make sense, and again, the math might not work out exactly, but wouldn't it make sense that the clock, every second it ticks on Earth, it takes two seconds to reach you? So it's going to be half as fast as you're going away. The, clock, the time on Earth, or every second that clicks by, you're another distance away going half the speed of light. So every second on Earth actually feels like half a second, looks like half a second to you. So it's really cool looking, actually. You're watching everybody on Earth going, whoa, they're not moving very fast. They're going really slow as you're going whipping away, right? Mm-hmm. OK. This is what we call time dilation, OK? From your moving frame of reference, the clock and the events in the reference frame are in slow motion. Mm. OK. So there. There was our like, little thought experiment. We're going to get into another one here in a little bit. Special relativity makes us think twice about our universe. Okay? We know that speed is relative, okay? which means that it depends on the speed of both the person watching and the person admitting or, or doing the traveling. Okay? But speed of light is actually fixed. This is where it gets weird again. Okay, It is not dependent on the speed of the source of the observer. Unlike everything else we know, like arrows flying out of the back of trains and apples being dropped out of cars, right? It's not. We usually think of time as absolute, meaning that it passes at the same rate. But it doesn't actually. Time actually can change. And you might think to yourself, well, that's all tricks right now. We're moving away, and it looks like the time is slowing down, but it really isn't. Well, hmm. let's look at a couple other things. And then, by the way, we're going to get done with it. I think we should just press through on this stuff, and then we'll get to another thing. And then I got a little video that I think you'll love after it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a break. OK, we're going to continue the thought experiment. 
pretend you have a clock, but it's a very special clock. It is a clock that bounces light off of two mirrors back and forth. And they're perfect mirrors. So you shoot a beam of light out here, and it goes up here, and it bounces off, and it comes back here, and it bounces, and it bounces, and it bounces, and it bounces, and it bounces. Pretty simple. This is actually a really long clock. It's 3,000 meters long. Okay? The reason it's 3,000 meters long is so that we can, whoops, we can figure, we can do the math pretty easily. Okay? If it's 3,000 meters long, the light takes how long? 3,000 meters distance divided by speed, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, gives you the time to go from one end to the other. 0 0.0001 0, 0, 0, 0, seconds. Not quite a microsecond. It's actually 100 milliseconds. No, sorry, a hundredth of a millisecond. Millisecond, millisecond, hun ten, hundredth of a millisecond. So 10 microseconds, let's say. Yeah. Milla, micro, yeah. To go from one end to the other. Okay. With me now? Now, let's take our little light clock and we put it in a spaceship. Okay? Here's you sitting in the spaceship, watching the light go up and down. Okay, and that's what it's doing. Going up and down. It's a big spaceship. Because that's 3,000 meters from there to there. So it's, it's a big man. <laughs> You're watching it go up and down. The rest of us are sitting on the ground. Doesn't it make sense that the light has to go from here? You're moving through space, right? The light has to actually go from here. This path here hits the top of the light and goes down here because the spaceship is moving past you. So far, so good? Does it make sense that if you're watching the light, you go, ah, the spaceship's moving past me. The light doesn't go straight up and down here. But if we, if we want, the light has to go this way to hit the top and then this way to get back down. Everybody with that so far? OK. The person in the spaceship sees the light go up and down. The person on the ground sees it go up and back. All right. Well, as we see, light has to travel farther according to us. Doesn't it make sense? This is 3,000 meters, 3,000 meters. This is 3,000 meters this way, and however fast it's going this way, and you do the Pythagorean theorem and all this, and you come up with this distance is much longer than this distance, right? And this distance is much longer than this distance. So we see it going a longer distance, bigger distance. What did we say the speed of light was? 300,000 300, kilometers per second, no matter who's watching. This value is the same. The speed of light is the same. If the distance is small, in other words, going straight up, straight down, and the speed of light is the same, doesn't this ratio have to be the same? Well, it has to be equal to this. So if the distance is small, the time is small. If the distance is big, in order to get the same exact number when you divide the two numbers, time has to be bigger. Has to be bigger. Let's, let's do a really easy example. Let's say the speed of light was 3, right? And the distance was 30. What would the time be? 10. OK? Let's say the speed of light is still 3, and the distance is 3,000. What's the time? 1,000, right? Because 3,000 divided by 1,000 is 3. So you see how in the spaceship, if the speed of light is constant, which we said it has to be, and Einstein said, look, buddy, it has to be, because Michelson and Morley measured that, and that's all we can go by, then the amount of time has to change. Like the actual time has to change. Hmm. So you say, that that guy's, well, you're the one on the spaceship. You say that your time was 3, right? No, what did we say this was? Yeah. 3 30. and this was 3 and this was 30. So 3 and you said the time was 10 seconds, let's say, right? I say the time was 3,000 and 1,000. I say the time was 1,000. You say the time was 10. Who's right? Both are. You're both right. Depends on who's observing. When you get back, by the way, you would compare your watches and you'd say, the guy in the plane says, 
hey, or the spacecraft says, hey, that only took 10 seconds. And, and you're going to say, no, no, that took you 1,000 seconds. Well, you, somebody's, you know, you're both right. And that's what's the paradox about it. Because you're both right, but you can't both be right because it couldn't have taken well. It could take more time. It wasn't that just that they were different places. It's they were going different like speeds. Like it's literally you, his watch. So here's what you do. The guy, you're on the spacecraft. And, you, and we both say, you say it took 10 seconds. And I say it took 1,000. Well, you say, let's do it again. But this time, we're both going to have stopwatches. And we're going to make sure we check it. So you go up on the plane. And you go, boom, flying by. And you, and you start your stopwatch when it starts. And it goes up and down. And you stop the stopwatch. And you say 10 seconds. And your stopwatch says 1, 0. And I do the same thing. Boop. What's that? What would my stopwatch say? Seconds. No, my stopwatch would say 1,000 seconds. Hmm. Let's go back a sec. It's different, point of view. it's different points of view, but the stopwatches don't lie. Right? Hmm. This is what's weird. This is why it's weird. OK. This guy says, I got a stopwatch. Boop, boop. And he says, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. And you say, OK, go. And it's the same exact picture here. He's measuring it inside his spaceship. So he doesn't think it, he just thinks it's going up and down. You say it's got to go from here to here to here. And you measure it 1,000 seconds. And your stopwatch takes a whole 1,000 seconds to do that. This is a long distance, by the way. Right? OK? You go, you, you, he comes back, you look at your watch, and you go, his says 10 seconds, yours says 1,000 seconds. Who's right? How long did it take? They're both right. According to you, it took 1,000 seconds. According to him, it took 10 seconds. He is now only 10 seconds older, and you are 1,000 seconds older. Really, really works. That's why it's travel age faster. Okay. That's why this whole idea of time travel is true. Okay. And by the way, we could do this. If we could go fast enough, we could actually do it for like real stuff. Okay. Here's the deal. The slowing of time is not just for that clock. It's for everything going that speed because it's time itself in that frame of reference. Mm -hmm. The spaceship occupants don't notice anything weird, OK? Because the laws of nature are the same. OK? So the question, though, is how do the spaceship occupants view our time? Okay? They look at our time. And they say, from their frame of reference, we're the ones going slow. That's what I was going to say. It would be the same thing on the people on the other planet. Same it's thing on the people on the other planet, yeah. It, it's, it's, they're going to look at it and see. This, is an, this seems like a paradox again. But the measurements don't need to agree because they are in different frames of references. The only thing they need to agree on is the speed of light. OK? Now. What if you had a third party? A uh, third party might see it completely differently, too. It depends. So serving both the things at the same time in both pools. Uh, well, it depends. Is he moving? No, he's stationary. Well, then he's the same as you standing on the ground. He's the same as us standing on the ground. Because <laughs> he's standing on the ground. Relative yeah. to the other guy, he's the same. OK. You lost your paradox. OK. Now, I'm not going to worry about the details of this math. But it's actually pretty simple when it comes down to it. Speed of light times time is this distance. Speed of light times time is this distance. Okay? The speed of light times, well, the time for you on Earth is this distance. Speed of light times the time in the spacecraft is this distance. The actual distance across the Earth is this distance. Okay? You can actually do a little bit of math here. Okay? The diagonal lines show the path of the light. It goes from, position, goes from position 1 to position 2 and then back down. Okay? And you can do a little bit of this math here. Okay? And from the clock's frame of reference, the time takes is t0, straight up and down. Okay? We get the distance. Again, I'm not going to go through all the math here. But it looks like this. And this looks hard, but it's not. This is not that hard. It's just squaring a couple things. This is Pythagorean theorem, by the way. A squared plus B squared equals C, or A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Okay? When you go and you do a little algebra, which you all learned, here's what it ends up coming out to be. Okay? This says that the time on Earth 
is equal to the time observed by the guy in the spacecraft divided by this square root symbol divided by 1 minus the speed of the spaceship squared divided by the speed of light squared. Let's just do a, a, one more thing before I let you guys take, this, take a break. Let's compare something. B for the denominator and denominator? What's that? The square root shouldn't be at the bottom. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You'll see. OK, let's see. Can I see that? Can you guys see that? Yeah. Barely? OK. Let's say you're standing still and the guy next to you is standing still and you both have stopwatches and the clock is going up and down. Don't you both measure to be 10 seconds? Yeah. Click, click, right? Yeah. How fast is the spaceship going? Three no, no, no. Let's say you're both standing next to each other. His spaceship's off and he's standing next to you. How fast is it going? It's just sitting there. How fast? Speed. Yeah, but it's just sitting there. Zero. zero. Yeah. What is zero divided by the speed of light? Zero. Zero. What's 1 minus 0? Zero? 1. 1. What's the square root of 1? One? 1. What's t divided by 1? One? 1. T. t. Your time equals the time of the guy. Okay. Let's say, let's say that the speed of the spaceship was the speed of light. Let's just say the guy is now moving the speed of light, fastest possible. What is the speed of light divided by the speed of light? One. 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 What's one minus one? Zero. zero. What's the square root of zero? Undefined. No. Zero. Square root of zero is zero. Zero times zero equals zero. That's the square root of zero. What is t divided by zero? Undefined. Undefined. So as it turns out, this, this breaks down when you try to go as fast as the speed of light. Let's try something big, 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 though. Let's say you're almost at the speed of light. 0.99999999 times the speed of light. Okay? 299,999 kilometers per second divided by 300,000 kilometers per second. Is that going to be a big number or a small number? Small. It's going to be very small. What is? Minus. Hang on. Is it going to be very small? Yeah. 299, well, yeah. squared, yeah. It's going, to be, it's going to be very small. Okay. Hang on. Well, yeah. So, well, it's going to be very small. It's going to be very close to 1, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's going to be like 0.99999. Yeah. What's 1 minus 0.99999? Point, point, well, 0 0.99999. Yeah, it's like, it's like 0 0.00000001. What is a number divided by a really, really, really small number? It's a really, 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 really big number, big number right? So the time for you on Earth looks like a really, 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 really big time out there. Okay, So remember how the spaceship went past and they thought it was 10 seconds and you thought it was 1,000 seconds? That's because it's very, 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 very big. Okay, This is crazy stuff. Now, let's go on a break because I'm done with the slides and I want, you to, I want you to process this for 10 minutes. And then I got a video and I got one other thing to tell you about this. Okay. All right, so um, I promised you a little video that talks about this stuff. Who's our favorite video person? Dr. Hewitt. Hewitt, right? Paul Hewitt. And this is, actually, this is actually a very unique thing for Paul Hewitt. It is actually a cartoon okay, that he drew way back when he was taking physics, way back when. And uh, I think he did the music to it, and he did the, all the animation, and blah, blah, blah. But it talks about an experiment with two guys who, want, who are twins. And it's called the, the twin paradox, which is what he, uh, which is what he draws here. And, and it takes a little bit of time to process it so, a little bit. But he goes through it twice, at least twice, and you'll see. But, but we'll, we'll talk about it in the end. But it, it's all the stuff we've just been talking about, relativity. So here we go. Did you know that time is different when you move at different speeds? 
that when you move through space, you change the rate at which you move into the future? Well, you can't really notice these differences for everyday speed, but for really high speed, like for rockets traveling about half the speed of light, these time differences can be noticed. Let's take a look at the so-called twin paradox. Well, bye. I don't know. I'll let you get it. Yeah, I got a great one for you. Yeah, you know, I really don't know the answer. I got a giant one. It's a giant one. I got a giant one. What? Now, while the traveling twin experiences the heat, the stay-at-home twin experiences years. Something. No, I think I'll just sit here and do nothing. Yeah. That sounds like, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, what? What? Well, look, what is going on out there? Oh, my goodness. I, 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 I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't see you. I must relax. I can't relax. I'm too old to relax. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm too old to relax. I don't know what I'm doing. 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 I don't know what I'm say from the Earth and from a high-speed rocket ship. A clock can be anything that measures periodic intervals of time. To simplify, we're going to let the ticks of our clock be periodic flashes of light. L look at the light flashes emitted by the stationary rocket ship. Now some time goes by before they reach the distant planet, but since there's no relative motion involved, successive flashes get to the planet at regularly spaced intervals. That's to say, both the sender and the receiver will agree on the time intervals between the flashes. Now, there's nothing unusual about this. But suppose the rocket ship moves. Look at the Doppler effect. An observer sees the flashes at shorter intervals. Suppose the ship moves fast enough so an observer sees the flashes at intervals twice as short as the ship sends them. Then if the ship moves away just as fast now, an observer is going to see intervals twice as long. Like if the rocket sends a flash every six minutes, they'll be seen every 12 minutes by the observer when the rocket moves away. But every three minutes when the rocket's approaching. Now let's apply this to time dilation. If the ship passes by the Earth and moves away at the same high speed for one hour and quickly turns around and then returns in one hour, rocket ship time, this two-hour trip is seen by the Earth as taking place not in two hours, but in two and a half hours. And this is because the ship and the Earth have been in completely different realms of time. Let's look at this in greater detail. Suppose that when the ship goes by the Earth, that clocks on Earth and on the ship are synchronized to 12 noon. Then as the rocket leaves the Earth, a flash of light submitted by the ship every six minutes. That's six minutes rocket time. Then the ship emits ten of these six minute flashes while going away from the Earth. The tenth flash is going to be emitted sixty minutes after leaving the Earth. Then the ship's clock is going to read one o'clock just when this tenth flash is emitted. Now suppose this is the moment that the ship turns around. Our Earth observers don't see the turnaround until they see the tenth flash. Now here it comes. It's going to take some time for it to get to them. Closer, closer, closer. Bam, there it is. Ten flashes, twelve minutes apart. That's 120 minutes, two hours. So that means it's two o'clock now on Earth. Now the ten flashes the ship emits when approaching the Earth, they're going to be seen three minutes apart, or all ten in 30 minutes. The first is three minutes after two o'clock, Earth time, next is three minutes later, and so on, until the last flash is emitted just as the ship whizzes past the Earth. 
and that's going to be 2.30, Earth time. So a clock aboard the rocket ship reads 2 o'clock, while a clock on the Earth reads 2.30. This checks out. Check the figures. Let's go through this once again. Watch carefully and compare the clocks. We'll get the same result if we switch frames of reference. The Earth will send flashes now at six minute intervals, and the rocket ship will observe them while again departing and returning on what for the ship is a two hour journey, one hour out and one hour back. While going away, the ship's gonna see flashes 12 minutes apart. That means it's gonna see a total of five flashes during this hour of going away. See that? Now while returning, the ship sees flashes three minutes apart. They're gonna see a total of 20 during the hour of return. For the round trip then, the Earth emits a total of 25 flashes. At six minute intervals, that's 150 minutes, or two and a half hours. Same results as before. So from either frame of reference, a person on Earth ages more than a person in a high-speed rocket ship. It's not so much a question of who's moving and who isn't, but rather the different space-times experienced. The person on Earth remains in one space-time throughout the experiment, whereas the person in the rocket ship is in a completely different realm of time while traversing space going away from the Earth, and in still another realm of time while traversing space and coming back to the Earth. That's two space-times. Two space-times separated by the acceleration of the ship and turning around. Now that acceleration is interesting in its own right. Get to that in general relativity. But we see that the details of that acceleration aren't really essential in this case. The principal significance of that acceleration is that it marks the changing from one space-time to another. Now our twins have been in different space-times and they can meet again at the same place in space but only at the expense of time. Isn't that great? That's time dilation. Peace. Where did the time go? Does anybody, does anybody know? When did the day break? Someone dry.
Thought it said Paul Hewitt on there. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> Paul Hewitt, there we go. All right. Okay, you had a question, Tom. So, Wasn't that good? Oh. Yeah. So with a parsec being <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, the parsec. Yeah, the parsec is a distance, actually. Is it a distance? Yeah, parsec's a distance. That, that's what it was. But that, that but yeah, there's a yeah. You can the, there might be some time dilation. Well, here's the interesting thing about there's there a couple interesting things about that. The first interesting thing is so at the beginning, Louis said, "Hey, can we can we actually go through like talk about time travel?" Well, we are talking about time travel here. If you are going at a, so let's say you've got a planet 150 light years away, right? 150 light years away. If you and I were to try to go there, right, it would take more than 150 years to get there if we're just driving, obviously. It would take a long, long, much longer time than that, and then we'd be dead, right? With this idea of time dilation, you can actually go somewhere in a time that the light actually takes to get there from like standing on Earth in much less time on your own watch than that total time. So in other words, if your planet's 150 light years away and you're going at a speed close to the speed of light, that might only take you a year. Right? It took 150 years according to the people on Earth. They're like, bye-bye. 150 years later, they're like, well, I made it there. Right? Because they know how fast light, the speed of light is. Well, more than 150 years if you're going close to the speed of light. But your watch might only read a, a, a year. So you can actually travel through, you know, you can get to places that are farther away than the time that it takes light to get there in, the, in that sense. And in that sense, you're traveling through time. Another way to travel through time is the way we just saw it happen. The dude who was the twin who was older, basic, sorry, the twin who was younger, I guess, traveled through time, in other words, a longer amount of time to get back. According to his watch, it was only weeks, yet his twin was years older. Right? So in that sense, he's gone through time. Okay? So you, you can go forward in time. You can't go backwards in time. It's the only problem. But you can definitely go forwards in time. So if you wanted to do something like this, you could go to a planet 150 light years away if you go fast enough. It'd only take you like a year. And then it'd take you like a year to get back, let's say. But everybody on Earth would have aged like 300 years. So, you know, you get back and like, whoa, it's really cool, but all your friends are dead. You know, but it's a trade-off, I suppose. The other thing was, OK, here's where the twin paradox part comes into play. If you reverse the whole situation and you said that, let's say that the, you pretended that it was the rocket ship that stayed still and the Earth with the twin was the one going in the opposite direction and coming back. Who would be older then? Yeah. The, the guy, rocket ship guy, would be older, right? Why is that a paradox? Well, it's a paradox because it ma matters who's actually doing the traveling in that case, right? Remember right at the end of the video, Paul Hewitt said, he said, it's the acceleration at the end that makes a difference. Remember how we said at the beginning that special relativity, relativity only has to do with constant movement? When the spaceship goes out, can it come back without accelerating? Is there any way it can stop, turn around, and come back without accelerating? No, it, it has to accelerate because it has to slow down and then it has to speed back up to come back. That acceleration is the part that makes it so that he's the one that ends up younger than his twin. Until that acceleration happens, whoever does the accelerating is the one that's going to end up younger. But until he does that acceleration. Now, what did I say about coffee? Or a little earlier? The acceleration is the one that is going to spill. 
So in order to figure out which twin is going to be younger, you look at the one that spilled his coffee. Because he had to slow down and speed up, and that's when he spilled his coffee. The guy on Earth just sat there the whole time. He didn't spill any coffee. He had his coffee and didn't spill. It's the, one in the, it's the one that actually spills his coffee when he turns, turns around real fast. He's the one that ends up as the younger twin. OK? So kind of cool stuff, huh? All right. So I thought I was going to have time to do this, but I don't want to. We've covered so much tonight. This is um, a little thing called how to become older than your parents. Uh, older than my parents? Yeah. How would you do that? It's like the guy who, it's like the twin who becomes older than his other twin, right? Or his twin, right? You could do that with calculations for your own folks if you want. It's actually possible. We'll do this, maybe we'll do this in the lab. That's what we'll do. Okay, last thing, the test on Saturday. It's the final. It only will cover the chapters from chemistry on to astronomy. It won't cover the last chapter, which I kind of supplanted the last chapter with this special relativity stuff. The last chapter talks about general relativity. Oh, one other thing I forgot to tell you. I forgot about this. You know, we talk all about this, and we draw little fancy cartoons, and we do all this math. And you still might be saying, it's not really true. Time doesn't change. Like this whole idea of mind-blowing idea of time doesn't change. As it turns out, we can measure this stuff. And you guys have all seen or used a piece of equipment that need, needed to use these things in order to work. What is it? GPS. GPS. GPS satellites are moving so fast. Well, first of all, not, not so much they're moving so fast. GPS satellites rely on atomic clocks on board the satellites that are very, 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 very precise, like down to the, like microseconds and nanoseconds and all that. Very precise. Those satellites are traveling around the Earth. And by the way, they're far enough away from the Earth that you've got other relativity effects as well due to gravity, the general relativity, that they had to make sure that they figured out the relativity time dilation for those spacecraft in order to get your GPS correct. Some, some of the engineers didn't believe it. They were like, yeah, this relativity stuff, not quite sure. Well, that's supposedly they, true. I'm not sure they did. They tested it. They're like, oh. Well, once, yeah. once, well, they said maybe it won't matter, right? They said it probably won't matter. The, one, the other side, the scientists and the engineers who built it said, yeah, well, it will matter. And they built it in. If they hadn't built it in, you'd look at your GPS, and you might fix your location. And then like an hour later, you'd be a kilometer off or something like that. Or a day later, you'd be a kilometer off. So they had to use relativity to make it work. So pretty cool stuff. Anyway, back to the test. It won't cover the last chapter. It'll cover every chapter except 22 and the Latin 28. And it will be on uh, chemistry up through those chapters. Sorry? Oh, uh, I've done reviews up to, is it 21? No. Is it? Oh, yeah, 21. OK. So what I'll do is 23 through 27. I'll do a review. Uh, I'll try to put it together by tomorrow. And then you can look at that. And then uh, Saturday will be the test. If you have any questions about any of it, please feel free to email me. Yeah. And we'll see then. The test won't be as long as uh, the last one, I don't think. So just so you know. But that doesn't mean don't study. It means yeah, still study. Um, the papers, I will have the grades to you by midweek. So let's say Wednesday. So I'll I tell you what, here's what I'll do. Are you guys on board, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you the grades. I still want to, I do want to curve the final exam. But what I'll say is if you get an A, B, C, or D on the final exam after the curve, this is what your final grade will be. How's that sound? So you kind of know what you want to shoot for. Does that make sense? For lab class, um, if you did all the labs, you'll get an A. If you were here for all the days and you did all the labs, you get an A. If you owe me some labs, I've already emailed most of you guys, but if you owe me some labs, um, you may not get an A if you don't give them to me by next week. Okay? I have to put the grades in by the, like the 15th. So a few days after the end of class, grades have to be in, and then I can't change them. OK? Any questions? All right. I guess I'll see you on Saturday. <laughs>